Good morning, great to see you all. As James said, my name's Dan, I'm the pastor here along with Kate and um, it's such a privilege to be part of this community. And we're going to be thinking across the day about what it is that changes our world. Now, um, as humans, we talk a lot. And uh, what do we talk about? Well, studies show that 60% of the time we talk about ourselves. And that raises to 80% on social media. But it's not all uh, just self-focused, because what aspect of ourselves we most talk about is actually love. Love is what we talk about the most, it's what we sing about the most, and it's not just us. Harvard did a 75-year global study looking at what is the most important thing to, to cultures across the globe, across the planet, and the answer is simple, it's love. And the reason that this is the case, the Bible tells us, that is that we are made in the image of God. And that is an idea that has transformed the world, that we are made in the image of God, and that because God is is love. That is why our greatest need is to love and to be loved. Now, when a relationship breaks down, we feel pain. We feel hurt. Why? Because the love is blocked. And at that moment, we have two choices. We could either stop the pain by stopping the love, or we can ask God to provide a new route for that love to travel. And that's what we see that God did, that when our relationship with our Father in heaven broke down because of us, because of our sin, that he did not stop the love, but he chose a new route for that love to come to us. And it came via the route of the cross. The cross is the ultimate picture of God's love for you, for us, and for the world. We're told that God so loved the world that he gave his only son, Jesus, so that whoever believes in him should not die but have eternal life. That is how much God loves you. That if you were the only person to have ever done anything wrong, Jesus would have gone to the cross for you. The Son of God loved me and gave himself for me, we're told, so that we can have freedom, have eternal life, and have a restored relationship with our Father in heaven. Now, you might have heard the phrase, hurt people hurt people. Hurt people, hurt people. Come across that? Yeah. Um, Well, the opposite is also true. That loved people love people. Loved people love people. That our ability, our capacity to love others is linked to the extent to which we have experienced love ourselves. And the good news is that even if we've had a tough life, even if we have not received the love that we should have received, you can receive it as we look at the cross of Jesus, and you can receive it as it is poured out into your heart by the Holy Spirit each day. And that changes our ability to love. Now, one of the ways that Jesus tries to show us this is by telling a story. And that might seem a little underwhelming, but Jesus' stories have transformed the world. Actually, the story we're going to look at today has so captured the imagination of the people who've heard it that it transformed the world. This story has shaped societies, breathed life into laws. It's so contagious that probably you and I would kind of take it as self-evident. We take it for granted, having lived in in a culture that for 1,500 years has been telling this story over and over again, passing it down for generations but like imagine if like imagine yourself in like first century Rome first century Rome and it's the first day of the week everyone's supposed to be at work but as you walk past this place suddenly you're like there's a load of people in this place they should be at work but they're not and then you look in and you're like hang on it's it's men and it's women it's rich and it's poor. It's slaves and it's free. It's, it's people of all races. There are Jewish people there. There are Roman citizens there. And they're gathered like, oh, they must be up to no good. Uh, but they seem to be worshipping. But they're in a house, not a temple. And there's no idol. They're worshipping the God who is amongst them. What is going on? See, Caesar would have loved to have united the whole world under his rule. But the only way he could do it was with power and oppression. And when the power went, the civilization collapsed. But Jesus' love draws all people together. 
And it's this story that helps start that revolution. You know, it is reading this story, the fruit of which changed the world. You know, it, it, it's this story that charities started. It, it exploded into hospitals and orphanages. And this compassion erupt that tr- started to transform the early centuries. Now, it's not that this compassion comes from us. It's like Jesus has given us a beautiful song to sing. And this song is unsurpassed. But sometimes as followers of Jesus, we're not the best at singing it. We're sometimes off key. We're sometimes not in tune with other people. We don't always sing it well. But when we do, and when we sing it consistently, things start to change. Now, what started and triggered Jesus to tell this story was a question. And it's a question we all ask. It's the question... How should we live our lives? What should we do with our lives that mean we can experience the best life possible? Well, here's what Jesus says. This is found in Luke chapter 10. I'm going to start at verse 25. So on one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now here he is talking about life after death, but he's also talking about life in the fullness now. Because if death is coming, then so much of what we point our life towards, the strategies we have to live well, will ultimately point, prove to be futile and uh, will be frustrated unless there is eternal life. So it is about the future, but it lands in the now. It's an important question. And Jesus replies, what is written in the law? How do you read it? Which is fascinating to me. That Jesus, who is the word of God, points back to the written word of God when he asks a question. And and, and there's a few reasons. Partly it's because there's nothing in this that contradicts who he is. But also it's, it's his end goal. God doesn't want pets. He wants children. He doesn't want robots He wants friends. And in pointing to his written word, he's giving them agency. He's honoring them. He gives them the dignity of responsibility. That when you and I have questions about how we should live, how we should be guided and navigate the challenges of our day to day, Jesus had honored us with the dignity that says, look, look, read my word, seek me and I will guide you. So he points back to his word and the lawyer answers this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. You've answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? And you can't miss the comedy of that. It's like there are two commands. The first is to look at the great God of the universe who deserves all honor, glory and praise and go, oh, I need to love him with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my strength, uh, all the days of my life. And he's like, yep, tick, done that. What's next? And so it's on to his neighbor. And it's like, and Jesus in his grace gives him a pass and replies with this story. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road when he saw the man. He passed on by on the other side. So to a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him, bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. When he put the man on his own donkey, he brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, which is like two days wages, and gave it to the innkeeper and said, look after him. And when I return, I'll reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man? who fell into the hands of robbers. The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Amen. This extraordinary story begins with the religious lawyer asking an extraordinarily flawed question. 
It's a really not a very good question. And it's kind of a picture of God's grace right up at the front that some of Jesus' greatest words come from the silliest questions. I've actually found it's a good rule. I try and do this in my own prayers to not filter my questions because I often find it's the most selfish, most self-centered prayers that I pray that I get the the clearest response uh, from Jesus uh, and hear from him so often. The lawyer asks, what must I do to inherit eternal life? It's silly. You don't do anything. Inheritance is a gift. You normally receive it from one other family member. And verse 25 and 29 reveals the motive. He's trying to test Jesus and justify himself, which is the opposite of what we should do. We should trust Jesus and test ourselves. But he's trying to, trying to prove himself. He's trying to save himself by his actions. And we can't. It's a gift given to us. Eternal life is the free gift given to us through the cross. And, and we receive it by faith. What does that mean? Well, faith is synonymous with trust. Uh, a picture of it is that you are all putting your faith, your trust, in your chairs at the moment. You're putting the full weight of your being on your chairs at the moment. Now, you could sit there for the whole service not trusting your chairs and sort of like squatting in a stress position just in case the chair breaks. And you're going to use a lot of energy and you'll be very stiff afterwards. But Or you can trust the chair. Jesus is saying simply, look, trust that I love you. Don't use all this energy trying to earn my love. Use that energy to enjoy my love for you and for others. And so he points to the law and Jesus says, what is written in the law? How do you read it? Now, when he says law here, he's, he's talking about the law given to Moses, which covered every aspect of how they were to organize their lives. And so there's a lot in it. And so trying to sum it up was, a, uh, was a, a frequently debated thing. It was something people felt, you know, they talked about a lot. There were different opinions. They, 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 they were passionate about it. I kind of think like how people used to speak about Brexit. It'd be that kind of thing. Everyone's got an opinion. And, and one of the things that is often said is what this lawyer quotes. He says, look, it's love God. That comes from Deuteronomy chapter 6. And it's love your neighbor, which we find in Leviticus 19. It's a summary of the whole law. We often use the words, it's, it's to love God with passion and to love people on purpose. And the order is important because we can't love the unlovely neighbor until our heart is filled with the love of God. But it's first as the love of God is poured out into our hearts, then we're able to love those around us. So Jesus says to the lawyer, yeah, well done. You've answered well. Do this. And you'll live. But follow your own advice. All you need to do is practice, practice completely unqualified, unfiltered, perfect love for God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength every day of your life and your neighbor as yourself and you will live. But the problem is we can't do that. You know, we all know there's things we want to do and we don't do. There's things we don't want to do and yet we do them. It's part of our sinful condition. And it should have been obvious to the lawyer that he needed to throw himself on the grace of God to receive this free gift. But instead, he asks a second flawed question. He asks to clarify and he's trying to justify his actions. And he asks, who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? And I think what he's wanting here is Jesus to kind of limit his responsibilities. He's probably thinking he'll say, well, there's, there's my family, I need to love them, and then maybe my friends, and then all those in my nation, so the Jewish people. And then he's probably thinking, oh, there's that bit in Leviticus about loving the foreigner who lives in my country. Well, I need to love them, and, and that's probably as far as I need to go. And of course, Jesus then replies with a story rather than an answer. Why a story? Because he wants us to think about this. He wants us to wrestle with this. He wants us, you know, when somebody says something direct, it's just simply not as potent as when people work it out and discover it from themselves. And the issue that this guy has raised, he doesn't realize it, but this is everything. This is the, how do we deal with the fact that, that we've not been a very good neighbor to God? And so how is God going to love his neighbor? All the way down to, oh, that person who is at the neighboring desk at work, who has a habit that slightly irritates me. How do I love and get on with them? And then everything in between, every area of human conflict. And Jesus' stories are like trees that keep on growing. The more you lean into them, the more they grow, the more, the more they embrace you, the more they challenge you, the more they encourage you. And it's a shocking story. The summary is, this is my summary, 
there's a, there's a man, presumably a Jewish guy, he's walking from Jerusalem to Jericho and he's attacked by robbers. He's beaten, he's stripped, he's left for dead and he's found by three different people but only one of them does something to help. And it's not the one we would have expected. Now, in the temple, which was the center of their life and their nation, there were three types of people who worked there. There were the priests, the Levites, and then there were just regular kind of uh, Jewish men. Now, first of all, a priest came by, and he would have been coming from the temple. They would work in Jerusalem, but live in Jericho. So he's probably done two weeks' work on shift. He's probably pretty tired. He's traveling back with the food that he's earned for his family. Um, but these guys were wealthy. They were hereditary roles. He'd been the elite. He'd almost definitely had a donkey with him. So he could have put this guy on the donkey and helped him. Could have done it. But when he sees the guy, he's faced with a dilemma. And the question is, who is this man? Because if he's a fellow Jew, then he's got a legal obligation in the law to care for him. But if he's not, then he doesn't. And the problem is, all of the ethnic or social markers of language and accent and clothing, they're gone because this guy has been left unconscious and naked. So he can't tell. He doesn't know what his duty is. And so when he's not sure, he falls on the side of limiting his love. In the priest, we see the barriers that we often face when it comes to loving our neighbor. I know I face these. It's, it's the barrier of inconvenience. It's the barrier of cost. If the priest had touched this guy and he did turn out to be dead, as a priest, he'd have had to go and do these rituals. So that had been more time. He'd have had to go back. His food would have spoiled. So his family would have had to buy food. It would have cost money. Also, if he'd have touched him, he turned out to be dead. In that culture, one of the ways they throw, showed grief was by tearing their robes. So again, another cost to, then, cost to then repair your robes. So he's like, oh, is there all this obligation? And if he is, then I need to do this. But if he's not, oh, I don't have to. So rather than risk it and know it, he walks by on the other side of the road. Next comes a Levite. And these guys, were the, they were the assistants to the priest. They worked in the temple. They were builders. They were worship leaders. They were assistants. They were guards. And it might have even been the assistant to this priest. And, and so seeing the priest leaving the injured man, he's probably thinking, wow, he's set a precedent. I don't want to, I don't want to upstage him. I don't want to make him look bad. Like rule one of the workplace is make your boss look good. So like, oh, you know, who am I? Who am I to... No, you know, I can't read the law better than a priest. I, I mustn't upstage him. Now, that's another barrier to loving others, the peer pressure. Have you ever felt it uh, at work, maybe not to befriend the tricky or unpopular person in the office? It's, you know, everyone else is walking by. It's, I don't want to be the outlier. I don't want to make them look bad. So the second person walks by. And then comes the third person in the story. And I think everyone there was expecting it to be one of the regular Jewish guys who worked in the temple. They're thinking, ah, he's telling a story about how the rich elites don't care. But us regular people, we care. We respond. But he doesn't. Instead, the hero is the hated outsider. See, the Samaritans and the Jews did not get along with each other. Why? Well, all the usual reasons. Racial, ethnic, tensions over land, religion, politics, and culture. And it had gone on for generations. And yet it's the Samaritan, the persecuted, who ends up loving the persecutor. And the word that is used here is compassion. He has compassion on him. It's the word used to describe Jesus whenever he sees the crowd and he responds by healing the crowd or feeding the crowd or speaking to them about his kingdom of heaven. This is a picture of the love that Jesus has for us. How do we get that kind of compassion? Well, it seems to be that this kind of compassion is often given and triggered by proximity. Like, look at the passage. It, the Samaritan, as he came to where the man was, when he saw him, he took pity, he went to him, and he put the man on his donkey and brought him. There's something about proximity that releases compassion and releases love. You, you, it strikes me that people who really make a difference, it tends not to just be what they do, it's the way that they do it. And it's the proximity that matters the most. Um, there's a guy who we have links with from our previous church. And, um, and in, in rural Kenya, there's a place called Lodwa. And, um, 
Uh, and in that region, there's somebody who's, who's led the community there and made a massive impact over many years. Um, but it's not who you'd really expect. It's a, it's a Malaysian man called Francis, which is obviously he grew up quite far from, um, uh, from Kenya. And when Francis was a student, he felt called to serve outside of his home. Uh, home country and uh, he felt this calling so he thought I'll put it to test so he wrote to different churches and different agencies and nobody replied except one that was in Lodwa Kenya and so he was like okay well there I go so he packed his bags and went off on this long journey and whilst he's there it's been amazing what he's been able to facilitate he's helped the community build schools and pharmacies and hospitals and water systems and he he created this community called the community of St Paul but what's fascinating is the people there, they don't really talk about anything that he's done or led them to do. They just talk about him being one of us because he lived with us. He left his home and he became one of us. It's what Jesus models for us. He, he didn't stay far away. He came up close. He came in flesh and he dwelt among us. And the Samaritan is motivated by this love to get even closer than he already is. You cannot love at a distance. I wonder who the Lord might be asking you to get close to at the moment. I wonder who the Lord might be asking you to get proximate to at the moment. And I love being part of this church because you all do this so well. I love the way that you love each other in groups and on Alpha and, and in Safe Haven. Uh, I thank you for all that you do. Keep being open. Keep asking this question, Lord, who is on your heart that you want to share with me? And there's something that's so practical about being present. You know, Jesus didn't come as sort of a, a big zoom screen in the sky and just sort of beam things down. He came to us and he lived amongst us. His presence is the model for how we are to love. You know, one of the ways that we try and do this and grow in this here is safe haven here at Sabinas. And one of the things that you guys are involved with... Um, is here we help work with the probation service to host a space where people who are coming maybe out of prison and working with the probation service to rebuild their lives can have a space that's where they can be hosted and served. And, and um, Claire was telling me this week that there was a, there was a new guest who came. It was the first time there and she was obviously a bit nervous and she was welcomed uh, by you who were part of that. And somebody made her a cup of tea and she started to cry and she said, why are you treating me this way? I'm here to be punished. To which the person replied, no, you are here to be loved. You're here to be loved. So often we come, and I think we come to our Father in heaven, and we're expecting to get the, maybe a word of condemnation or critique. And the word he has for us is, you are here to be loved. Now, one of the barriers that we have to loving people, I think is imposter syndrome. We kind of think, well, who am I? to try and serve someone else? Who am I to try and love someone else? And the way we grow in this confidence is to recognize that we're just following after Jesus. We're just playing catch up with what he's doing. Look at it here. We read that then he put the man on his donkey, brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I'll reimburse you for any extra expense you have. The church is supposed to be like one of those little inns along the road. And Jesus finds people and he brings them to us and he says, look after them the way I have looked after them. We get the confidence to serve because it's Jesus who is asking us to do so. And yes, it's costly in time, in money and strength. But Jesus' promise is this, when I return, I'll reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Life is supposed to be love's training ground. And the church is supposed to be a gym where we're stretched in our ability to love and to grow, to learn to love, but also to learn to be loved in return. Now, the surprising thing here is that it's the Samaritan who's the neighbor, not the wounded man. You know, the lawyer asked, who is my neighbor? I.e., what's the least I can love and still be considered a good person? And Jesus doesn't respond to that. He, he says, look, which one of these three proved to be a neighbor to the man? In other words, he said, don't ask, who is my neighbor? Ask, who, um, who proved to be a neighbor? 
He challenges the approach. But remember, this is about having life in its fullness. This is what we're all hungering for deep down. And so what it means is Jesus' teaching here means that my need to serve is greater than anyone else's need to be served by me. My need to serve is greater than anyone's need to be served by me. And as we look out at our city and our families and our workplaces, there is a lot of need of people needing to be served. And my need is even greater. If you like, it's a picture of what's going on in my heart. And so the lawyer comes and he he asks this question. And we read this. The expert in the law, and I'm assuming that's slightly sarcastic. The expert in the law replied, The one who had mercy on him. You know, isn't that striking? He couldn't even bring himself to say the word Samaritan. He's like, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus finishes with these words, go and do likewise. Asking who is my neighbor is the wrong question. The right question is who must I become a neighbor to? And Jesus says, we'll start with your actual neighbor And then go from there to anyone who is in need. You know, if I am asking that question, do I need to love them? The answer is yes. You need to love them. And not just for their sake, for your own sake. And this lands into everything that deep down we are longing for in our own lives. But also everything that our culture and our society is longing for. See, Jesus seemed to think that our primary response to any global or regional or local conflict was to love our neighbor. It doesn't matter what we do or what we say or what we post, if we do not love our neighbor, then we are undermining that which we are trying to do. The command to love our neighbor was not a metaphor for something else. It literally meant to learn to love our neighbor. You know, our society is desperate for this because we're living in this weird time in the West where we have all this fruit of the tree of Jesus's teaching, but we're kind of saying, well, we don't want the root. We don't want where it's come from. And so we're searching for equality and equity but but we we can't get it because if you think about it like any metric you use whether it's strength or productivity or creativity or attractiveness we're all different we're we're completely different from our neighbors the only thing in which we are all equal is the amount by which our father in heaven loves us and the extent to which he went to show that love by sending his son to die on the cross. Do you know what? You you are so valued. You are so worthy because worth is determined by the amount people are willing to pay for something and Jesus was willing to pay everything for you. That is the ground on which our, our equality is built, but it's also the power in which we have to seek to share it with others. It's the dignity of love that we have been given. And the metrics we usually use to limit our love, whether it's race or religion or politics or our past or ability or viability, they're no longer valid. Why? Because those things didn't stop Jesus when he picked me up, when he picked us up. See, the key thing is we are only able to love in this way if we see ourselves first not as the innkeepers looking after people Jesus has brought to us, not as the Samaritan doing wonderful things, but if we first see ourselves as this wounded traveler. I am the wounded traveler. Jesus found me abandoned by the side of the road, bruised and battered with nothing to offer. And religion couldn't help and piety couldn't help and I couldn't help. But he stopped and he picked me up and he carried me. And in doing so, he paid the price. The Samaritan makes a risk. He carries this guy into the town. He might have been beaten up just being there. He also had a half dead guy on his donkey. He looked really guilty. He took a risk, but Jesus didn't take a risk. He gave it all when he laid his life down so that we could be set free and that we could be reconciled with him and with each other. It was a risk. But what do we do to inherit eternal life? Maybe that question wasn't so foolish to begin with. Somebody has to die. And Jesus died so that we wouldn't have to. And in that moment, it's that debt of love that each of us carry in our hearts starts to be filled up as we look at the cross to see how far he went and receive his love by the power of the Holy Spirit that lives in us and wants to be at work in our life. Loved people are able to love people. Amen? Amen. Why don't we stand?